So voters in Kentucky, New York, and Virginia cast their ballots uh, yesterday in that, those states' uh, primaries, but it may take a while to find out exactly who won. Kentucky is on track for historic voter turnout, with over one million people expected to cast ballots this year. Several changes were made to voting in the state to allow for an increase in voting by mail. According to The Washington Post, election officials staffed 200 polling places for yesterday's primary in a state where there are usually 3,700 in a typical election year. So let's see how things went. We're going to bring in uh, Ed O'Keefe. So uh, certainly a lot of people have looked at these primary um, these primaries as a test for what could happen in November if uh, we're still dealing with all of this COVID stuff. Um, what did we learn about the voting in New York um, and the impact that it's going to have on, you know, when we might get results? Yeah, and I, and I think that's the takeaway. If you don't live in New York, Kentucky, or Virginia, and Marie, and you think, why should I care? You should care because what we're seeing is several states over the course of the summer have to take several days, if not weeks, to get final results because the crush of absentee ballots that have been requested are just too much for elections officials to count that it can take several days. And so if you think about it, with all the interest and in likely pent-up demand to participate in November's election, you get an absentee ballot, you send it in. We could be sitting here through mid-November, potentially, in some states, waiting for results. And if the election's close, you know, we could be left uh, waiting for much longer than usual to figure out who exactly won. If it's a blowout, that's another thing, but we're not there yet. But anyway, one of the things to, to, to sort of see here in New York and in Kentucky uh, is that uh, younger, far more progressive, and minority candidates look to be on the verge of eking out some narrow wins. And all of that is in part due, actually a big part of it, is the fact that the country has been so focused in recent weeks on calls for racial justice, for police reform, uh, and for, you know, lifting up uh, the views and, and, and the leaders of minority communities. And that is the case in a few of these congressional races in New York and this incredibly unexpected turn in the Democratic contest in Kentucky, which I know we're going to get into. Uh, yeah, we are going to get into that, Ed. But let me ask you uh, about uh, New York specifically. Uh, the race between incumbent Democratic Congressman Elliot Engel and progressive and first-time candidate and former middle school principal Jamal Bowman is being closely watched. Now, what, what I find, what I'm curious to understand, Ed, is the fact that Bowman is competitive. Does that have to do more with his progressive policies um, and the fact that he's a progressive candidate, or is it fatigue that a guy like Elliot Engel has been in Congress for as long as he has, and people are just tired of the same old, and the fact that Elliot Engel was caught on a hot mic uh, a few weeks ago saying uh, that if he uh, didn't have a primary, he wouldn't be attending an event that he was uh, at with uh, Ruben Diaz, who's the Bronx Borough president. Yeah, that's all of the above. It's all of the above in this case, Vlad. Uh, and, and part of this was driven by an article in The Atlantic magazine earlier this summer where a reporter went to Engel's home just about 15 minutes from where I am in Potomac, Maryland, which is a northern suburb of D.C., where Engel lives with his wife. His wife uh, has worked for a federal agency here in D.C. for many years, and so they've essentially made suburban Maryland their primary residence. This reporter went and knocked on his door and found Engel at home, who sort of stumbled through an explanation as to why he'd been spending more time in Potomac, Maryland, than his district in New York, which was being ravaged by the pandemic. He showed up a few weeks ago, you point out this hot mic moment, for an event not about the pandemic, but about actually police reform and, and all the concerns raised by the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and was heard saying to one of the leaders of this event, I wouldn't care if I didn't have a primary. It was like he said the quiet part out loud, and he got caught on a hot mic saying it, and of course, instantly, it was turned into two different attack ads on him. So look, he's been in office since 1989, uh, doesn't live in the district, uh, you know, doesn't have politics that match up with a growing percentage of people in the district. Sounds a lot like what happened two summers ago when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez knocked off another longtime incumbent, Joe Crowley. Same dynamic in this case. And what's even more interesting is Elliot Engel is chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He is the Democratic check on the Trump administration's foreign policy. Voters in his district didn't care because, you know, look at what's been going on in their neighborhood. The pandemic, the economic mm. fallout from it, and the growing concerns about police reform, 
And voters, it appears, don't think he's there with them on it. Hmm. Um, another interesting race in Kentucky. It's for the Democratic Senate primary. That's what happened in Kentucky. Um, pretty much a toss-up between um, a moderate candidate uh, Amy McGrath and uh, liberal state representative Charles Booker. The thing about it is McGrath sort of seemed like she was the favorite for a while um, to go head-to-head -head against Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell in November. That doesn't look like it's the case right now. Give us sort of the lay of the land in Kentucky. She has a narrow lead right now, and the reason why people think she might be toast is because we haven't seen the vote count come in from Louisville, where Representative Booker is actually from, and where they believe a lot of his base of support is based. Um, McGrath, if you're somebody who doesn't pay close attention to politics, I, I totally get it, but you might remember her as the candidate who two years ago was running ads about the fact that she's a former fighter pilot, and she ran for the House. She lost that race narrowly and immediately began running a Senate campaign against Mitch McConnell. She's raised more than $40 million. So on paper, a female former fighter pilot who's been able to raise $40 million to run against Mitch McConnell sounds like a Democratic dream come true. But here again, the, the case of um, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, where Booker represents, uh, you know, growing concerns among Democrats in Kentucky that, you know what, McGrath's been trying to thread this moderate needle be middle of the road. She's not taking bold positions. That's what we're looking for. Here comes Booker uh, from way behind and appears to have possibly closed the gap and may just narrowly win. And what a dynamic that would set up to have a 35-year-old black state representative who has been involved in the protests there in Kentucky about concerns about why the police officer who killed Breonna, allegedly killed Breonna Taylor, uh, hasn't been arrested despite being fired, running against the Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, who's arguably target number two across the country next to the president. You know, it's a state that favors McConnell right now, but it would be a really interesting contest to watch, wouldn't it? Mm. Uh, it would indeed, Ed. Um, let me ask you, before you go, Ed, about uh, former Vice President Joe Biden's search for a running mate. CBS News has learned that Congresswoman Karen Bass, who is the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, is undergoing vetting as a candidate. I also note that Kamala Harris, Senator Kamala Harris, was on CNN last night uh, talking to Anderson Cooper. And when he mentioned her uh, as a potential vice presidential uh, running mate for uh, Biden, she didn't correct him on that. Uh, she just sort of nodded along to that. So there's a, there's a list of people that the former vice president is, is looking at. Karen Bass is just the latest that we're learning. So I got a question about her. What are you hearing uh, with regards to that search? But also, the latest polling out of the New York Times shows uh, Biden, and I know this is a national poll and it's still early, but it does show Biden has a, a, a jump on President Trump. The question is, the, the, the Trump uh, uh, campaign seems to be trying to engage with Joe Biden, but if you're in a Biden campaign, are you hearing from them that this idea that Biden is not that visible is working for them, given that the poll numbers are coming out in his favor? I mean, yeah. They don't even have to say it. I look, look, at, look at what's gone on in the last few weeks. The president's been doing and saying all sorts of things, and his numbers keep going down. We don't see much of Biden, and his numbers pretty much stay where they are or are climbing, depending on, on the group of people. So, yeah, I mean, uh, they, they don't like to talk about it too much because they don't want to jinx themselves. But sure, not seeing him as often as we're seeing the president seems to be something that is, is playing out in their favor. They know it's not sustainable in that he's going to have to, especially come the fall, be far more present. Um, but, you know, the virtual events that he's been holding and the, and the smaller events that he's been holding in person, mostly in the Philadelphia area, because that's the battleground state closest to his home in Delaware, are working as far as they're concerned. Mm. The question is, lift up the rug. Uh, is the campaign doing enough to actually make sure people are requesting their absentee ballots or planning to show up and donating money and their time to help find other voters to turn out? Because it's all going to be about turnout and turn out in a way that's never had to be done before in this country, given the pandemic. So, uh, you know, he may be leading right now with about 132 days to go, but can they sustain that? And does it mean that voters actually show up? Remember, that complacency concern has bedeviled Democrats in the past. We just have to go back to four years ago. And that's the point that President Obama made last night in their first virtual fundraiser together. He said, look, Democrats, you can't get complacent. If you guys think that this guy's beatable, remember, the president won four years ago, and he could very well do it again. In terms of the running mate uh, situation, yes, Karen Bass, former speaker 
of the California Assembly, who, if you talk to people on the Capitol Hill here in Washington, have long believed actually could be a future House Speaker here once Nancy Pelosi is gone, mm. because she has, you know, experience running a legislature, the largest state legislature in the country. She is a woman, she is black, and she's from California. And those three things right there could potentially be enough to win you enough votes in the House Democratic Caucus to become Speaker. But Vice President obviously is a promotion, uh, far more prominent than being House Speaker, and she's on the list now. Doesn't mean she's going to get it, but it shows you that the Biden campaign understands that these type of people deserve and warrant further exploration at this time. And, you know, that is something that's never been done before. And whoever gets it, uh, it is a testament to the growing political power of black people in this country, especially black women who have stood up and insisted that after decades of strong support for the Democratic Party, they deserve to be taken seriously. They're being taken seriously. Kamala Harris, Val Demings, Karen Bass, Keisha Lance Bottoms, those aren't household names. Those aren't women that were being talked about much even a year ago, and it says something about the times we're living in and, and that people are listening. Indeed they are. Uh, yeah, really interesting, Ed. Great conversation. Thank you. Anne-Marie and Ed, I also note, uh, Ed, you referenced uh, the virtual uh, fundraiser that uh, f former President Obama had with uh, Biden yesterday. They raised $11 million for people to see them basically tell them, I love you, man. <laughs> really remarkable. <laughs> Imagine if they did that every Thank week. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. <laughs>